It's a proven Hollywood formula. A helpless victim is trapped in the spell of an evil villain who uses hypnosis to control his subject's every thought and action. But could that really happen? Is it possible for someone to use psychological techniques to control the mind of someone else? The potential power of hypnosis has been recognized for centuries. In fact, hypnotherapy for healing and religion dates back to some of the earliest records of human history. But it took the Austrian physician Franz Mesmer and his radical work with psychiatric patients in the late 1700s to bring hypnosis into the modern age. Today, hypnosis has been effectively used to treat many psychological disorders, including anxiety, PTSD, and addiction. But we still don't know exactly how it works. Debate continues over whether a hypnotized subject has really entered an altered state of consciousness or is simply suggestible. Either way, in the hands of the wrong person, hypnosis meant for health or healing can lead to fears of mind control. Throughout time, there have been reports of skilled hypnotists taking advantage of susceptible victims and brainwashing them into committing dangerous or lethal acts against their own will. On this episode, we'll look at one of those reports that ended in murder. It is the case of Pell Hardrup, who in 1951 shot two tellers while robbing a bank in Denmark. After Pell was arrested and evaluated, he claimed that although he pulled the trigger of the gun, the person who was really responsible for the crime was Bjorn Nielsen, a former cellmate who he said directed the act by hypnotic suggestion. Copenhagen, March 21st, 1951. It had been an unseasonably cold year, but the bitter chill of the morning didn't seem to concern Pell Hardrup as he cycled through the snow-covered streets to his new job at the Danish Oil Burning Company. The 30-year-old man had bigger things on his mind than the weather. Three months earlier, God had told him to save the world. When Pell arrived, he immediately went to his supervisor and requested the morning off, claiming he had some personal issues at home to resolve. The supervisor had no reason to suspect he was lying, and when Pell promised he would make up the missed time, his supervisor agreed. After their exchange, Pell walked to his clothing locker, glancing back over his shoulder with a nervous air. He opened it and retrieved a concealed pistol and bullets both wrapped in separate bundles of cloth. He placed him in his briefcase and said goodbye to his boss, then cycled away down an icy street. But instead of returning home to his wife, Pell went on to fulfill what would be his infamous destiny. He was going to rob a bank. The bank heist plan started with establishing his alibi, a friend's heavy drinking aunt with a flawed memory. On his way to her flat, he made sure to stop by a liquor store and purchase a few beers for them. Once there, Pell got his cover story rolling, and they started to drink. When the clock struck 10.30 a.m., he decided that the old lady was sufficiently drunk enough to not recall things clearly. Pell told her that he was stepping out for more beer and would be back in a few minutes. But when he left her flat, he never got around to buying that beer. Instead, he put his briefcase back onto the bicycle and rode to a bank at number 58 Norenborough Street to accomplish the messianic prophecy he had set out to do. Pell anxiously parked his bike on the pavement but then froze. He was scared, really scared, and his body did not want to move. He thought hard for a moment, reminding himself that completing the robbery was God's will. His courage was finally restored and at 10.45 a.m., he took a deep breath, put on a pair of sunglasses, and walked through the double doors of the bank. Pell Hardrip's life would never be the same again. He entered the lobby and immediately pulled out his pistol, firing a shot into the ceiling amidst the startled crowd of customers. He shouted at the nearest cashier to fill up his briefcase. The stunned man did not react fast enough to his demand so Pell shot him down in cold blood. 
Unfazed, he turned to the next cashier, now commanding him to fill his case. The bank crowd was in a complete panic, screaming and clamoring for the exit. The heist was not going as planned and taking much longer than Pell ever anticipated. The street outside began attracting passerbys to the commotion, some of whom tried to cut off Pell's escape route. When the bank alarm was tripped, Pell was convinced he was about to get caught. Distressed, he raised the gun again, this time at the second teller when he tried to escape for his life. But it was too late. Another innocent victim killed in the wake of Pell's chaotic rampage. Empty-handed and fearing the authorities, Pell fled the building and jumped onto his bike, pedaling furiously away from the scene of the crime. Another cyclist tried to cut him off, but just before colliding, Pell shoved the pistol into his face. The man quickly backed off, clearing the way for Pell's flight. Despite the deadly failure he left behind, Pell congratulated himself on his cool composure. He even spoke with a pedestrian who asked him what was going on, suggesting for him to go over and find out. Pell made it back to the flat of his drinking partner, explaining to her that someone had robbed the bank. She was uninterested and irritated. Where was the beer he had promised? Realizing he had better strengthen his alibi, he changed his coat to make sure no one would recognize him and headed back down the stairs to the liquor store for the promised alcohol. The moment he walked out into the street, he sensed his demise was near. It was empty and eerily silent until a faction of police stormed the scene where Pell stood, still armed. Hopelessly outnumbered, Pell raised his hands in surrender. When investigators first brought Pell in for questioning, they felt triumphant. This seemed like an open and shut case. Not only had they caught their murderer, but Pell confessed to the crimes. When they initially asked why he had committed the callous acts, he calmly explained that he was raising funds for the political party he had founded, the Danish National Communist Party. The money from the bank heist was going to help him prepare for the Third World War. Pell believed the DNKP would bring about world peace. The police were bewildered by him. How could a man who has just robbed a bank, killed two men, and was facing long-term jail time be so composed? When asked whether he felt guilty for the double murder, Pell assured them that he didn't. Why should he? God had told him to do everything. God was always with him, and it would be all right in the end. More than just a few eyebrows were raised by Pell's bizarre statements. Investigators began to suspect that there was much more to this case and that Pell had not acted alone. There had been an almost identical robbery committed seven months earlier, and when a known criminal named Bjorn Nielsen showed up to claim ownership of the bicycle used in the crime, police took interest. It turned out that it had also been Bjorn's aunt, whom Pell was drinking with the morning he was arrested. The correlations between the two men only expanded from there. A cursory investigation revealed that Pell had spent three years in Horson State Prison as Bjorn's cellmate. Former inmates of the two men recalled that Bjorn had exerted an unnatural influence on Pell, who acted almost puppet-like under Bjorn's will. Bjorn was hauled in for questioning, but nothing useful emerged at that time. He admitted that he and Pell had been cellmates, and that he had been involved in the early stages of the political party long ago. Yet other than lending Pell his bike, he claimed he'd had nothing to do with the robbery. But the inconsistencies in the two men's stories began to add up. Pell said he had stolen the bicycle. Bjorn said he had lent it to him. Pell said that Bjorn had nothing to do with the DNKP, but Bjorn admitted he was involved. Bjorn also indicated that he knew more about the crime, at one point even suggesting that it was Pell's wife, Bente, who was behind the whole thing. It almost appeared as if the career criminal Bjorn Nelson was trying to get Pell, a lackey with naive messianic tendencies, in deeper water with authorities. Nobody was buying either man's story. On June 21, 1951, Pell was taken to see Dr. Max Schmidt, the city's chief police psychiatrist. 
Schmidt was intrigued. Murderers in Copenhagen were rare, and cases like this, even rarer. He recounted to Schmidt everything he had told the police, and that he believed in fate and life after death. Pell even compared himself to Joan of Arc. Trying to understand more and possibly connect Bjorn to the crimes, Dr. Schmidt gave Pell an intravenous shot of a truth drug. When the drug took hold and his subject was fully relaxed, Dr. Schmidt asked the one question he really wanted answered. Where did he get the idea to rob the bank from? Pell simply responded, From it, my guardian angel. Dr. Schmidt intensified his process of getting deeper into Pell's psyche, giving him repeated doses of barbiturates and pushing him to admit who was behind the crime. He wanted to hear Pell confess that Bjorn was the guardian angel, pulling Pell's str- puppet strings. But Pell continued to deny it all and was adamant he had found God before he had ever met Bjorn. Without enough evidence to keep him in jail, Bjorn was released shortly thereafter. After an exhaustive analysis, Dr. Schmidt concluded with 100% certainty that Bjorn had somehow persuaded Pell to commit the crime and that he was still exerting so much control over Pell that he could not or would not admit to it. As to the nature of Bjorn's hold over Pell, Dr. Schmidt could only guess. Bjorn denied it, Pell denied it, and there was no evidence otherwise. That Christmas, however, after he had been told the results of Dr. Schmidt's report and assured he was going to be sentenced to life in an asylum, Pell had a change of heart. He wrote a letter to the office in charge of the investigation to confess. Writing on a children's notebook, Pell reinforced everything Dr. Schmidt had suspected and more. This letter became known as the Exercise Book Confession. Pell explained how he had been sentenced to 14 years in jail for being a Nazi collaborator during the German occupation. It was during his prison time that he first met Bjorn, a hardened ex-con who was also serving time for collaboration. Bjorn saw Pell as a vulnerable target and portrayed himself to the impressionable newcomer as an expert in Eastern mysticism, offering the practices to help calm the nervous young inmate. He introduced Pell to meditation and yoga, and the pair practiced the techniques at night in their separate cells. Eventually, Bjorn suggested that Pell ask if they could share a cell, which was when he really went to work on his disciple. In order for Pell to become one with God, Bjorn persuaded him to go into deeper states of meditation. That's when the hypnosis came into play, something Bjorn referred to as magnetic stroking. Before long, Bjorn was being hypnotized every night and receiving regular instructions from his guardian angel. Bjorn convinced Pell to become a vegetarian and to fast three days at a time and to give his extra food to Bjorn. Pell was instructed to give up all physical possessions, including his prized watch and accordion. These two landed in Nielsen's possession. According to Pell, Bjorn had even picked out the woman Pell married and had insisted on sleeping with her before the two of them were married. He, Pell insisted, had been completely under Bjorn's hypnotic control, and there was nothing he could have done to prevent it. Based upon the exercise book confession, Bjorn was rearrested and the police grilled him to prove that he was behind the robbery. Bjorn was sent to Dr. Schmidt, who performed a battery of psychological tests on him. He concluded that he was a criminal psychopath who bluffs and deceives others, but was also able to get people to trust him without limit. Bjorn denied everything, telling Schmidt that Pell's confession was just the ramblings of a madman. Doctors at the psychiatric department of Copenhagen Memorial Hospital tried to figure out how Bjorn had programmed Pell, but the attempts to hypnotize Pell by Dr. Paul Ryder, an expert hypnotist, were unsuccessful. Ryder was confused because tests revealed that Pell was unusually suggestible, making him an excellent candidate for hypnosis. Yet, he could not be hypnotized. Dr. Reeder concluded that someone else had programmed Pell to resist being hypnotized. This person could only have been Bjorn, who had seemingly programmed Pell to rob the bank 
and kill anyone who got in his way. Dr. Ryder was convinced that Pell could be hypnotized, but that Bjorn had given him a locking suggestion. This would ensure that should he end up in custody, a police forensic hypnotist would not be able to access his past hypnotic suggestions. Utilizing a powerful sedative, Dr. Ryder attempted to break open Bjorn's locking suggestion. Lowering the dose of the sedative over time, he was able to eventually hypnotize Pell. Taking him back in time, Dr. Ryder was beginning to understand how Bjorn programmed him to rob the bank. Bjorn persuaded Pell that magnetic stroking could give him the ability to pass through keyholes, walk through walls, travel immense distances in no time at all, and even be in two places at once. He started out slowly by making suggestions that Pell's arm was hot, cold, unable to bend, or impervious to pain. Soon after the arm was performing strange tricks, apparently outside his control, Bjorn explained these sensations were caused by an ancient life force that Indian mystics call prana. The naive Pell bought it. Then, Bjorn raised the level of control of Pell to a higher plane. Bjorn helped Pell make contact with a guardian angel, which instructed Pell that his struggles in life had a purpose, to lead him on a mission, which was his destiny to fulfill. The guardian angel told Pell that in order to prove his worthiness for the mission, he should discard all his earthly possessions, which were the root of all evil, and give them to Bjorn. He was told that all his physical possessions were to be discarded, including his wristwatch, because it bound him to this world. Pell gave his watch, valuable accordion, and even all of his money to his cellmate. The guardian instructed Pell to indulge in fast for up to three days, and of course, give his unwanted food to Bjorn. As the time for release got closer, the guardian angel began to instruct Pell to imagine committing crimes and give all the earnings to Bjorn. Stealing from others would also help to relieve them of the evil currency of this world. Even money that Pell earned from legitimate work should be turned over to Bjorn. Sure enough, when they were both released from prison in 1949, Pell began working but gave all of his wages over to Bjorn. Bjorn's hold over Pell was so strong that Pell even offered up his fiancée so that Bjorn could sleep with her. When Pell's family became alarmed at what he was doing, the guardian angel told Pell to disown them. Finally, his big life's mission was revealed to Pell. He was to rob banks of their evil currency and give the money to Bjorn. Pell was reluctant, so more yoga, meditation, and magnetic stroking were ordered. Bjorn repeatedly programmed Pell to believe that God wanted him to rob the bank. Pell finally gave in. Bjorn showed Pell a place in the woods where he was to hide the money from the robbery. The date was set, August 21st. When the day came, Pell robbed the bank and took a taxi to the woods to deliver the 1,900-pound bounty to Bjorn. When the first money began to run out, Bjorn, via the guardian angel, instructed Pell to rob another bank. If he was caught, Pell was instructed that he could never mention Bjorn's name. Dr. Ryder was impressed. To discover whether Pell really could be programmed to such an extent, Dr. Ryder attempted to program him. He told him that, that the letter P was significant and that whenever he heard him announce it, he would fall into a deep trance. It worked. Whenever the doctor mentioned the letter P, Pell would collapse. Dr. Ryder was convinced that Pell was truly under the hypnotic spell of Bjorn. By October 1952, Dr. Ryder had made enough headway to demonstrate his programming to police officers and the lawyers preparing to argue the case in court. He gave Pell a post-hypnotic suggestion that the next time he woke up, he was to ask the first man he saw his name, his age, when he had left school, and what had made him choose his current career. In front of all the trial lawyers, including Bjorn and the defense, Pell confronted the police commissioner with just these questions. He was put into a trance again and told to experience no pain. Dr. Ryder then shoved sharpened matchsticks under his fingernails 
and Pell didn't flinch. To demonstrate the power of his locking suggestion, Dr. Ryder offered a defense witness the chance to hypnotize Pell, but he was unable to break through. He even allowed Bjorn to have a go, and nothing happened. When the case came to trial in June 1954, Pell's lawyers did their best to prove that he had committed the crime under the influence of Bjorn's hypnotic programming. Bjorn's lawyers, meanwhile, argued the opposite. Police and psychiatrists were split right down the middle. A month later, the judge instructed the jury to consider three key points. Whether Bjorn had planned and promoted the robberies, whether he had planned and promoted the murders, and whether he had used hypnosis or some other kind of excessive influence on Pell. According to police, Bjorn had committed the almost perfect crime. He had hypnotized a man and sent him out to steal and murder, and then wiped out all memory of the killing. The jury initially refused to believe that anyone could be turned into a lethal robot against his own will. That is, until the psychiatrist performed his own hypnotic demonstration. First, he selected a perfectly ordinary woman, one of the last people who could be suspected of being capable of any crime of violence. Then, with permission from her and the court, Ryder hypnotized her and told her that her marriage was being destroyed because her husband was having an affair with another woman. He said over and over that her husband was in no way to blame, that he had been tricked and seduced by a viciously perverted woman and that she would be doing the world a great service if she eliminated this woman from the face of the earth. Not only, Dr. Ryder said, would this not really be a crime, she would be actually helping to protect other innocent people from the harm done by this evil woman. Also in the courtroom was another volunteer, a woman who had agreed to act as the evil seductress. Ryder told his guinea pig where to find her, and he handed her a gun loaded with blanks. You know what to do and why you have to do it, he said. So now wake up. When the woman awoke from the trance, she was obviously bewildered. She immediately stood up and searched the rows of people until she spotted the woman she had been told was the evil seductress. She walked over to the woman, raised the gun, and fired. If the gun had been loaded with real bullets, the seductress would have been dead. The jury was convinced. In July 1954, Bjorn Nielsen was convicted on all three counts. Both men were sentenced to life, Pell in a psychiatric institution and Bjorn in a high-security prison. Appeals went on for the next 10 years, during which the case was taken to the European Commission of Human Rights. The appeals were denied, but on October 24, 1966, Pell was released. Six months later, Bjorn also gained his freedom. One balmy summer night, nine years later, Bjorn committed suicide alone in his apartment. Hardrup changed his name to Pell Weichmann and distanced himself from anyone who could associate him with the name of Pell Hardrup and his crimes. Not even his best friend had the slightest idea of his past. He died of natural causes in 2012. So how much hypnotic influence did Bjorn Nielsen exert over Pell Hardrup? Dr. Ryder wrote a book based on his work with Pell Hardrup, continuing to insist that he had been a helpless victim. Even at the time, though, many of his peers were not convinced. In 1960, an article in the International Journal of Experimental and Clinical Hypnosis carried a skeptical review of Ryder's book and proposed that it was the relationship between the two that influenced Pell's behavior not hypnosis. On August 5, 1972, in an interview with a Danish newspaper, Hardrup admitted that he had not been hypnotized into committing the robberies or the murders. In fact, he said, it was only when the police suggested he had been hypnotized that he realized he might get off the hook if he agreed. That seemed to close the door on the hypnosis-murder relationship. However, in 2015, professional Jan Heliso claimed to have reopened it. Long fascinated with the 1950s Hardrick Nielsen case, he initially set out to prove once and for all that it is impossible to hypnotize the average person into committing murder against his will. Recruiting an unsuspecting member of the studio audience, 
a 19 year old medical student. He hypnotized him, told him he was his guardian angel and that he should do whatever he told him to do, including robbing an art gallery to get money that would make the world a better place. As directed though, the medical student not only demanded the gallery owner give him the money, he pointed a gun filled with what he thought were real bullets and shot a security guard three times. A young man whose mission in life is to save lives had just tried to end someone's just because he was instructed to do so. So could you be hypnotized and forced to do something illegal or wrong? Most scientists still insist that to convince a normal person to become a killer is extremely unlikely. But it may be possible to convince a person under hypnosis that something bad will happen unless they save the day. Hypnotically planning heroic images, feelings, and stories in an innocent person might convince him or her to commit an attack they would otherwise never consider. Fortunately, the likelihood of this happening is extremely rare. And as we know, there are far more people willing to commit murder under the thinnest of circumstances. Hypnosis is, in general, safe. People, though, can sometimes be dangerous.